Robert Lancaster. The Allied effort in World War II was designed by these three men, Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin. Within hours of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, Roosevelt and Churchill announced the support of their countries in the Soviets' fight against Germany. They pledged whatever was needed to defeat Hitler. The big three met twice, at Tehran in 43 and Yalta in 45. While Soviet, American, and British soldiers fought together against the common enemy, the leaders of their countries worked together to end the war and secure the peace for future generations. The culmination of the Allies' joint efforts was the meeting of Soviet and U.S. forces on the Elbe River in Germany. Our story, the Allies. called a summit meeting. That was a new expression in those days. Outwardly, all was smiles and goodwill. But when the cameras left, the problems emerged. There were three absolutely different individuals representing three absolutely different societies. An English aristocrat who'd been a lifelong anti-communist. A well-born American aristocrat who had the common touch the son of a shoemaker, the leader of the Communist Party. When 1941 began, Nazi Germany bestrode Western Europe with no opponent but England. It seemed at least possible that Germany might dominate the world. Then came Operation Barbarossa, June 22nd, 1941. extinction of the Soviet government and the enslavement of the Soviet people. to meet the threat, calling on all to defend the motherland. It became known at once as the Great Patriotic War. Along the front of 1,800 miles, the lands of Russia began to blaze. In London, Winston Churchill told the British they were no longer alone. At four o'clock this morning, Hitler attacked and invaded Russia. All his usual formalities of perfidy were observed with scrupulous technique. Hitler is a monster of wickedness, insatiable in his lust for blood and plunder. Any man or state who fights against Nazism will have our aid. It follows, therefore, that we shall give whatever help we can to Russia and to the Russian people. Two days later, President Roosevelt announced that the United States would send aid to Russia, though America was still at peace. For many people in 1941, the Soviet Union was unknown. Few considered the facts. The Soviet Union covered one-sixth of the land surface of the Earth three times the size of the United States. 
born in Leningrad, it was almost evening in Vladivostok. Immensely rich in natural resources, a land of wealth, diversity and strength, whose people spoke nearly 200 languages. In 1941, a special envoy arrived in Moscow. He was Harry Hopkins, one of President Roosevelt's closest aides. He was Roosevelt's eyes and ears. For the rest of the world, there would be questions about the Soviet Union. Would it collapse? Could it emerge victorious? concluded that the Soviet Union was ready for a long, hard fight. A month later, Churchill and Roosevelt met aboard a cruiser off the coast of Newfoundland. The outcome was the Atlantic Charter, which spelled out the ultimate war aims of the Western Allies. Within months, the United States was to enter the war against the Axis powers. In less than a year, the Soviets had accomplished a monumental task. The transfer of their Western industry beyond the Urals into Central Asia and Siberia, and with it, millions of Soviet workers. By the end of 1942, the transplanted factories were in full production. Throughout that brutal year, the full weight of the Nazi war machine pounded the Soviet Union. First Anglo-American supplies came through the Mideast by way of Iran and then through the mountains into southern Russia. In all, during the war, the United States sent a total of nearly $10 billion worth of aid to the Soviet Union. It represented, according to Soviet figures, about 4% of what the Soviet Union itself produced. was another route, from Alaska across the tundra ice to the Russian Arctic. Russian pilots arrived to ferry American fighters and medium bombers along the world's newest and least hospitable flight path. Then there was the third route, the most dangerous of all. The Murmansk Run. 
boys had no air cover for most of the voyage. Below, the German Navy's wolf packs lay in wait. Above, the Luftwaffe roamed at will. ship sunk, there were few survivors. The waters carried a lethal coal. Unknown War will continue in a moment. To Allies. Spring 1942. Word came to London to expect a Mr. Brown from Moscow. The visitor was Vyacheslav Molotov, People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union. On May 26th, Molotov and the British signed an Anglo-Soviet Treaty of Alliance. repeated the formalities in Washington, coming away with a similar alliance. The main thing the Soviets longed for from the treaties was a second front in 1942, something to ease the pressure from an immensely powerful adversary. recognized the need for a second front. The question was where, when, and how. Broadly, Roosevelt was more eager for quick action than Churchill. They both knew that a seaborne assault on Hitler's Europe would be extremely difficult. Churchill had special reservations. He was afraid of losses on the scale of those in the First World War, for which he had been partially responsible. He could not take that risk again, as Churchill's supporters explained it. Churchill dreaded giving Stalin the news that Russia would have to fight on without a second front. The Soviets interpreted Churchill's attitude as a breach of faith. It took all of Avril Harriman's diplomatic gifts to ease the situation. It was not that there was no sympathy for the Soviets. British workers took to the streets to show it. The Soviets sent an unusual ambassador to New York to make friends. A sniper, she had killed over 150 Germans. And this is Lieutenant Ludmila Pavlichenko. Ludmila is 26 years old. Her mother and father gave her a sound body and a good mind and trained her to be a social worker. I want to say that we shall overcome because there is no force that can interfere with the triumphant march of free nations. We must unite. As a Russian soldier, I give you, great American soldiers, my hand. Fellow soldiers, forward to victory! 
Lord Beaverbrook, British Minister of Production. And this is the day to proclaim our faith. Weapons we must give and raw materials. Bread we must give and sugar too. Men we must give. Equipped with tanks and with airplanes. That is the pledge of the Second Front. This check bought hospital equipment for the Soviet Union. The Dean of Canterbury constantly appealed for funds. Eleanor Roosevelt addressed many rallies. Medical supplies and comforts poured in, and perhaps the most precious and significant gift of all, blood. They sent notes to children they would never see, hoping they would enjoy their presence and wishing them well. The British and American supplies and weapons were welcome and significant gifts, but they were not what tipped the scale. As Avril Harriman said, we did the best we could, yet the Soviet factory supplied most of the war materials necessary for the fight on the Eastern Front. Workers in England gained a sense of fraternity with the Soviets at concerts, jointly sponsored. Russian production far outstripped what the Germans could produce. The Unknown War will be back after this. To Allies. Nineteen forty-three was the year of the signal Russian victory at Stalingrad, of successes in the Caucasus, in the gigantic battle at Kursk, at long-suffering Kiev and along the Dnieper. Things in Russia proceed as they are now, President Roosevelt reflected to his son Elliot. Then perhaps next spring there'll be no need for the Second Front at all. In Churchill's words, 1943 marked the turning of the tide. In Moscow, the victory salvos roared for Russian battle. American and British landings in the Mediterranean, North Africa, Sicily, Italy. But they were not the second front the Soviets wanted. 
Plans for the invasion of France were being developed in London, while the Soviets waited. Churchill had been concentrating on North Africa, on the Nazi menace to Britain's Mideast oil, and beyond that, the road to India. occupied with the Pacific and the Japanese in Southeast Asia. The three leaders met for the first time in November of 1943 at the Soviet Embassy in Tehran. Though each of the three had to serve the interests of his own nation, all sought means to strengthen the common cause against Hitler. Comparisons were made in private and they were painful. For every German division fighting the Americans and British, 10 were employed against the Soviets. It was also arguable that the Western Allies' efforts had drawn off Nazi divisions that might have affected the outcome in Russia. was one ceremony that symbolized their mood of mutual respect and friendship. The Sword of Stalingrad, gift of King George VI to the people of this hero city. In similar vein, the United States and Britain broadcast the monologue from the classic Soviet movie, Alexander Nevsky. We in Russia are children of peace. I, Alexander Nevsky, speak on behalf of Russia and I say this to the rest of the world. If you will come to us in peace, you are welcome. But if you come with the sword or the threat of the sword, then remember the old saying, we proved it true once again yesterday, proved it true on the frozen lake against the might of the Germans. Those who take the sword, by the sword shall they perish. After Stalingrad came retribution. Madison Square Garden, New York, an occasion celebrating unity. The guest of honor, Andre Gromyko, Soviet ambassador to the United States, comes for the first performance in the West of Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, composed in besieged Leningrad. Maestro Leopold Stokowski. 
continue in a moment. To Allies. Nineteen forty four was the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. Its debts were coming due. For the Soviet people, 1944 was the year of liberation, the year of beginning to rebuild. For the Red Army, 1944 was the year of predominance. Everywhere, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Red Army batted forward, across the Soviet frontier, surging for Berlin. In the recovered republics, life returned. The nightmare had passed, but not the memory of those who ended it and those who suffered it. Inside the Ukraine throughout 1944, there was a little piece of the United States. The airfield at Poltava, one of three. Heavy bombers of the U.S. Air Force flew into Poltava after bombing cities deep inside of Germany and our allies. B-17, the flying fortresses. Avril Harriman, United States Ambassador in Moscow, visited Poltava to witness a pleasant ceremony. American combat decorations for their Soviet allies. The Americans brought much to Russia besides warplanes. Poltava, the bombers were refueled and rearmed by Soviet ground crews for the second leg of their shuttle back to their bases in Italy. En route, they attacked strategic targets. Southern England. At last, the second front. The commanders had done what they could. The rest was up to the fighting men. They were ready. 
first airborne and seaborne assault ever conceived. the English Channel was a great challenge, he said. Napoleon and Hitler could not do it. The liberation of Western Europe had begun. Now there would be other homecomings. the free French tanks helped to liberate Paris and a new government was established. And Charles de Gaulle returned from his long years of exile to bring France back to her former stature. In the fall of 1944, Winston Churchill flew once more to Moscow. With American and British forces closing in on the Rhine in the west, and the Red Army gathering itself for the last assault in the east, the question was no longer how Hitler's Germany could be defeated. That had been decided. The question now, what was to be done when Germany crumbled? One thing was clear to both Stalin and Churchill. By far, the most powerful nation in Europe now was Soviet Russia. Churchill was dealing with a new, undeniable power. The old balance had shifted. Unknown War will continue in a moment. It's to Allies. There were some dying spasms. Nine days before Christmas of 1944, the Nazis lashed out in the West. Columns of SS panzers drove through the forests of the Ardennes in the hope of splitting the Allied armies in two. A quarter of a million crack troops. 15 infantry and 10 panzer divisions. Before they were stopped, they killed or wounded nearly 77,000 Americans. The Germans lost 120,000 men, 500 tanks, 1,600 planes. Churchill had asked Stalin for help. Advance the date of the Red Army's next offensive. 
January 12, 1945, the Red Army thundered out of its bridgehead. This year would see the end. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was beginning his fourth term as president. His family gathered for the inaugural. And many of his friends. In the days and the years that are to come, we shall work for a just and honorable peace, a durable peace, as today we work and fight for total victory in war. A month later, the Big Three met for the second time in liberated Soviet territory. Crimea. The place was Yalta. The street there still bears President Roosevelt's name. Roosevelt did not have long to live. February 1945, the eve of the last battle. Soviet troops stood at the Oder, 50 miles from Berlin. American and British armies stood at the Rhine. There was one military topic remaining, the disposal of Japan. At Yalta, the Soviet Union agreed to declare war on Japan within months of Germany's defeat. One ominous aspect of the war was not discussed in detail. Yalta was the last conference of the pre-nuclear age. The main business at Yalta was political, the future of Europe. There were some hard bargains. When the summit concluded, the mood was optimistic. We have all bound ourselves to work together to make sure that there is increasing happiness and prosperity for the broad masses of the people in every land. And that nations shall be entitled to live at peace, no longer in fear of vile aggression, of cruel aggression, no longer subject to the hard strains of war. President Roosevelt reported to Congress for the last time. Congress and the American people will accept the results of this conference as the beginnings of a permanent structure of peace upon which we can begin to build under God that better world in which our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, the children and grandchildren of the whole world must live and can live. The long-awaited link-up came on the banks of the Elba on April 26, 1945. The leader of the reconnaissance patrol, which first came into contact with the Russians, was William Robertson. I remember the uh, the actual feelings that we had when we 
across the bridge and met the Russian soldiers. It was a time of great excitement. Uh, uh, we were very proud to uh, uh, to be there. The the uh, both the Americans and the Russians were uh, very emotional. It was a very emotional scene. Uh, uh, there was a great deal of uh, hugging and uh, back slapping, and uh, we as I the trading of trinkets and watches and pictures. Uh, we celebrated, we toasted each other uh, with the schnapps and uh, cognac that the Russian, uh, Russians had, and uh, it was a, a scene of great jubilation. It was all over, all but the congratulations, the tokens of respect, the celebrations. Marshal Zhukov presented Generals Eisenhower and Montgomery with the Soviet Order of Victory. Only 20 were awarded during the whole course of the war. In conquered Berlin, the Allies, east and west, marched like brothers. Harriman remembers. The Red Army was achieved a, a glorious victory at great sacrifice, and the Russian people resisted the desperate privations which they were subjected to in Leningrad and in other parts of the country. And as I say, the, the, we, we, we fought together. We have great respect for what the Red Arm, Army did. And I'm sure, as Marshal Stalin said, the Allies contributed uh, to, the, to the destruction of Hitler. But I do hope this spirit of cooperation between nations that we had during the war uh, can be brought again uh, for, for peace and the development of, of welfare of, 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 of people. Children all can play A brand new hand to hold and shake A brand new world The best that we can make To these, after 30 years, more than a generation, it was truly the unknown war. Beyond their imagination in its ferocity, its horrors, its scale. In war, in the worst adversity, even strangers became brothers. In peace, it should be the same. A brand new life for you and me. And it's a brand new world as far as the eye can see. Next story, the Battle of Berlin. Vengeance came for the Red Army at the end of April 1945, as the Soviet marshals competed for the honor of taking the Nazi capital. The last spasm of Hitler's thousand-year Reich turned the city into an inferno. It was the climactic battle of the unknown war. Wednesday, the invasion of Norway tests Churchill's statesmanship on Winston Churchill, the Valiant Years. Then on Our Century, 
Germany's sweeping assault of Holland and Belgium forced France to mobilize on the war years. All Wednesday on a and &E. Now stay tuned for Women in Politics on A&E Premieres, next. <laughs>